testing was driving panic. We didn't take that lesson and then turn it into smarter actions. We continued, we doubled down on the lockdown. And the net result of those two species of error, the early misinterpretation of what this was, and then the misinterpretation of the case increases, we used that to conduct a, a bad panic reaction, which is now bearing the potential to harm people greater than COVID itself did. And in doing 16 or 18 national strategies, it becomes clear to me that there are certain ethical actions that you do to favor and benefit the population of a nation. There are certain unethical actions you can do, which hunters do and warlords do. We did those things here. We fed misinformation to a people at risk. And that is one of the deepest, one of the darkest human rights crimes that can be committed. It doesn't mean the virus is not deadly, but what we redid in the reaction became an artifice of political extremists, and those political extremists need to be held accountable. Their universities need to be held accountable. The foundations which fund those universities with offshore trading accounts, those need to be held accountable, and we need class action. We need those lawsuits filed because significant damage has been done, and it's going to manifest over the next three, four years. We panicked. And we saw the curve of increase that that what everybody called exponential increase. We panicked. So we demanded more testing. And that, in turn, showed that we had more cases. And then when we saw those increased cases, we panicked again and asked for more testing, then track and trace. And this cycle became like a lemming, a lemming rush off a cliff. It was a lemming cycle that fed itself. It was a downward, downward spiral. And that's why I called it continuous impairment in that, yeah. uh, in that little satirical comment. I want to make it clear. This is still a very dangerous virus. It is, it's more severe than the flu. It's just asymmetric. In other words, it's damage is done on a different end of the age tier spectrum than the flu. So for those under 60 years old, it's less dangerous than the flu. But for those over 80 years old, it's it's more dangerous than the flu. So that that, that asymmetry, if you will, has caused us a lot of, of difficulty in discussing this issue of the latitudinal effect, that there would be a latitude surge at the end of this under a, uh, under a Hope, Hope Simpson effect. Uh, we really didn't look at this from the perspective of Farr's law, that this was going to be a, a uh, not a, a bell curve, but a, a somewhat lopsided bell curve, a quick increase and a quick drop off. For some reason, we forgot all that epidemiological expertise and decided that this virus early on was some magical monster that was going to destroy us. This is an exceptionally dangerous virus. That, that's clear in the data. But what we've done may become more dangerous than the virus itself. That's, that's my central thesis right now. But early on, it, the, the intimidation factor, both from the virus and the news coming out of the WHO and China, I, I think it put us in a little bit of a fly, fight or flight, a social fight or flight syndrome, where we dropped our knowledge about latitudinal effects. We dropped our knowledge that uh, coronaviruses are sharply seasonal, and there are scientific studies which prove that out. We dropped our knowledge about FARS law. We lost our resident knowledge. We lost our mind over the panic ensuing, ensuing around this this virus. These are people who couldn't get in to get cancer diagnoses. And this is a large number of people. This falls under a thing called the law of large numbers. COVID is a an effect that happens to a small population, even though it sounds large to us. But cancer is an effect that happens to a very large population. So a very minor change in the landscape of cancer can result in a very large set of deaths at a later time. And indeed, that's what we're seeing occurring here is that malignant myoplasm deaths are on the increase, people that have lost their livelihood. And that's what really concerns me, the number of businesses that are operating below their break-even level and are having to shut down, reduce operations, lay people off. Really, one-third of the people I know right now who were formerly employed are now unemployed because of COVID. And they they won't lose their house during the COVID window. They're going to lose their homes two and three months from now. Those are the people I'm concerned about. That group of people falls under the law of large numbers. There are going to be dramatically more deaths that arise over the next three to four years from this SAA and A, suicide, addiction, abandonment, and abuse, than all of the COVID deaths. The stark reality is that 
that the COVID reaction response has caused much more misery and death than has COVID, the virus itself. Those who passed on out of the MMWR database, the, the, the NCHS database, those who passed on from COVID alone are 19% of the excess deaths that we've experienced since March 28th this year. 19% are just COVID. You look on the uh, on the death certificate and the U.701 categorization, primary cause of death is COVID, and there's nothing in the follow-on columns. That's 19%. Now, there's a thing called underlying conditions. Most people have underlying conditions. So if you're, di- if you're going to die, you're probably going to have a primary cause of death and underlying conditions. So this is, this should be common. 27% of the total excess fatalities that the CDC has reported in their database, the danger we have here is a thing called a nosocomial, uh, death. In other words, you're coming to the hospital because you had a heart attack. You're at risk of dying from that heart attack. And then you contract COVID because you're in the RNA footprint of COVID at the hospital during that window of, of you know, the high preponderance of the, the virus being around. That's the, the, the uh, group of uh, deaths that concerns me the most, where COVID is secondary or tertiary. That's 23%. Daily state reports are what I call uh, legacy death laundering, if you will. When you report a death for, as a state six weeks late, you're instilling panic in the population. You need to be clear and transparent on that data. That's still about 11% of total deaths. But the, the final important category are those deaths that originated from the panic response itself. That's 20% right now of all excess deaths that we've experienced this year actually were generated by our miscall politically and our bad actions in terms of social response to the COVID virus. And early on, I think uh, the the thirst for federal emergency money played a little bit into that, but I'm not sure that that was an incorrect thing to do. We we did need to allocate federal emergency funds to get testing rolled out and respond to the virus, but I think that it became an opportunity for a political extremists to then exploit the condition. And in order to exploit the condition and harm their political en- enemies, those who operate medium to small businesses, they had to somewhat continue this this forgetting of Farr's law, to continue this forgetting of Hope Simpson, to continue this forgetting of key epidemiological truths, and to squelch those things so that we could continue to harm political opponents. And this is what I call a human rights crime, because you do not spread misinformation to a population under duress in order to remove their sovereignty.